And um, this is the last session in our Kent Law School Summer of Law series, or the last session at least for 2023. And it's designed to be an introduction or a taster session to the criminal law and criminal justice. And um, we'll introduce you to some of the topics, some of the issues and some of the critical thought that you might expect to encounter when you come to study criminal law at Kent. So um, we'll introduce ourselves. Um, I'm Antonia Porter. I'm a lecturer here at Kent uh, Law School and I teach on the undergraduate modules of criminal law and also the law of evidence. So the law of evidence being um, which pieces of information can be admitted into the criminal trial. Uh, I also teach on postgraduate um, master's module contemporary issues in criminal justice and from time to time I can still be seen in the criminal courts instructed by the Crown Prosecution Service as a, a criminal advocate. Um, so over to my lovely colleague, Alison. Um, so hello, everyone. My name is Alison Holmes, and I'm also a lecturer here at the University of Kent. Uh, with Antonia, I teach on our undergraduate criminal law module, which is one of our core modules for all students. And I also convene our undergraduate policing module, which is an optional module for stage two and three students, where we look at the powers of the police and the role that the police play within wider society. And I also teach on a couple other optional modules, which are our data protection, privacy, and cybersecurity modules, which are also available to our stage two and our stage three students. Um, I'm just going to make a quick note about a general housekeeping point. So we will be asking you all to sort of take part and we have polls and different questions that we'd like to put to you. If you want to ask us any questions at any point, please feel free to use the chat function. So we will be monitoring the chat function and hopefully answering your questions as we go through. But we can also take questions at the end if you've got more general questions about what it's like at the University of Kent. Um, so please just do stay in touch with us and in contact with us throughout the session through the chat function or through the polls that we'll be putting towards you. Perfect, thank you. So um, yeah, this afternoon is a session that's going to introduce you to the role of the jury in the criminal trial. So what is a jury? Why do we have them? Um, so they have a practical function within the criminal trial, but perhaps they also have a more symbolic role in the administration of justice and the rule of, of law more fundamentally. Um, so that we have juries at all is usually pretty uncontroversial you know they are typically an institution that commands a lot of public support because instinctively we tend to be happy with the idea that you will be convicted if a jury of your peers accept that you are guilty of that offence um, but if they don't convict you juries also have a really important role if they find you not guilty if they acquit you um, they might be considered like a really important safeguard against excessive or perhaps misplaced um, state power. So what we want to do today is we want to ask the question, are juries really beyond reproach? What happens if a jury delivers a verdict that is just wrong or it's not accurate in law? Is that the kind of price that's worth paying? Because overall, you would rather have um, trial by jury in preference to, say, a single expert professional judge sitting um, to determine the case. So um, today we're going to trouble that usual kind of blind acceptance of the legitimacy of the jury verdict through an exploration of one criminal offence, namely uh, criminal damage. So the session will look uh, like this. Uh, first of all, we're going to have a look at uh, the makeup of the jury. So who qualifies as a juror? Uh, and then we'll think about what the jury does in the criminal trial. What's their practical role? Um, and then I'll introduce you to two competing kind of intellectual ideas about the symbolic role of the jury and what they may legitimately do um, and what decisions they might legitimately take in the trial. And then I'll hand over to Alison, uh, who will introduce you to some more black letter criminal law. So in simple terms, um, she's going to explain to you what the offence of criminal damage is um, and what available uh, defences there might be if you are accused of uh, damaging somebody else's things. Um, 
And then we look at the Colston 4 trial to explore what we've discussed. So was this a case where the jury effectively ignored or nullified the criminal law? Or was it a case where the jury legitimately interpreted the criminal law to return a verdict? And then we'll ask you, how do you feel about that verdict? What, what verdict might you have delivered if you were in the jury in that case? So the jury, what do they do? Um, so in England and Wales, in our criminal courts, um, we have what's known as an adversarial system. So adversarial systems are typically associated with common law jurisdictions, which England and Wales is. Um, and the adversarial system works on the assumption that it's for the prosecution acting on behalf of the state to prove the guilt of, of the accused person. And they do that by presenting their strongest evidence on behalf of the police who conduct the investigation. Um, and they aim to demonstrate the guilt of the offender to a requisite standard beyond reasonable doubt, which simply means that the jury have got to be sure that the defendant is guilty of the offence. Um, the defence don't have to prove anything. They simply need to raise a doubt about, in the minds of the jury about the defendant's guilt. So the adversarial system is often likened to a battle between the Crown, the prosecution, or is also known as the prosecution, uh, who act, they act on behalf of the state and the police and in the interest of the victim of crime as against the defence who act on behalf of their client, the defendant, the accused. So what about then the judge? Um, they sit as a neutral arbiter. They're a bit like a referee. Um, they make decisions about which pieces of information or evidence should be admitted into the trial based on the rules in the law of evidence. So, for example, the judge might decide um, whether the jury should hear that the defendant has previous convictions for similar offences, or they might decide should the jury hear from an expert about a particular matter. Crucially, the judge does not decide the guilt of the defendant. Instead, their job is to sum up or to summarise the evidence that has been heard in the trial. Uh, and they'll explain any sort of tricky aspects of law to the jury as well. And then we have the jury. So um, jurors are what we call the triers of fact. They decide the guilt or the innocence of the defendant. And their job is to apply the fact of the case to the law to reach a determination about whether the law has been broken. Um, so there are 12 jurors who sit in a jury um, and they are expected to return what's um, known as a unanimous verdict in the first instance. That's where everybody agrees the verdict. Or if they've deliberated for too long um, and they cannot reach that unanimous verdict, they, they might be directed that they can return a verdict where 11 of them agree or perhaps even 10. Um, now, the jury is the trier of fact in the Crown Court. Um, but in fact, 90% of criminal cases are, are decided and finished in the magistrates or the youth courts, so the lower courts that typically deal with less serious offences. The triers of fact in the magistrates court or the youth courts are three lay magistrates, three lay people. They're not um, uh, legally trained. And so they're like a little mini jury, the three of them making decisions in the case. There might also actually be a district judge doing that job as well in, in the lower courts. So actually, only about three or four percent of criminal cases result in a Crown Court trial by jury. So who qualifies then as um, a juror? Um, the basic rules governing who qualifies are found in the Juries Act 1974. Um, the jury is supposed to reflect the community as a whole, right? That's what gives its legitimacy, but that's not entirely the case. So although jurors are um, summonsed at random, they are drawn from names on the electoral roll. So some people might not be registered on the electoral roll. And the Royal Commission on, in Criminal Justice has been particularly keen to ensure that people from black and ethnic minorities register on the electoral roll for that reason, because um, it is right that typically registration is lower amongst that group as compared to, oh, excuse me, uh, as compared to white, white British people. So um, you must be over 18, but under 76, that was recently raised uh, from the age of 70. You've got to have been resident in the UK for five or more years. Um, and until 2003, um, those who were ineligible for jury service, those who could not sit, also included 
people who were concerned in the administration of justice, so people like judges, police, probation workers, solicitors, barristers, they could not sit, oh, and, and the clergy. That's changed. They may now sit on a jury. And I just wonder how you feel about that. Like, how do you feel about a police officer sitting on a jury, hearing evidence from one of their colleagues? Are they going to be more minded to agree with one of their colleagues? Similarly, if a judge is sitting in a jury room, will the jury place too much weight on, on their deliberations, on their views? So um, the, in actual fact, the, the net, um, the selection criteria in this jurisdiction is pretty wide. Um, but of that group, some further people are disqualified. Those who are mentally ill, for example, cannot sit. Um, uh, those who are on bail and those who have been sentenced to particularly serious matters. Minor convictions, you may still be able to um, sit on a jury. Um, interestingly, until uh, since... Um, or until 1972, to qualify as a jury member, you had to be a property owner, you had to be a householder. Uh, but that was really restricting the social composition of the jury, not least because at that time, um, women were not typically the householder, the, the property owner. Um, we do not have jury vetting in the UK. So in the US, um, jury, um, the lawyers can ask questions of their jurors to identify whether the jury member has a particular bias or political affiliation, for example. If they do, then the lawyer can discard that jury, juror from the jury. But we don't have that here. Uh, so before I pass over to Alison, let's just think about some of the advantages, some of the disadvantages of um, our system um, of having jury trials. And I think it's probably right to say that we shouldn't underestimate the impact that the historical legacy has on public uh, confidence. Trial by jury is this ancient constitutional right which originated in the Magna Carta, so in the 1200s. And that historical legacy really gives it authority. You know, it's demonstrably seen to have worked. Um, it's served us um, for a long time. Um, so the jury sits in court as a popular legitimation of the state's power. So what I mean by that is that they are this kind of visible representation or visible symbol of the rule of law. So effectively what the jury is saying is that we the people um, are happy to be made subject to these laws and actually more than that we're also happy to hold people to account when they don't adhere to these laws. So that's really important for the rule of law. Um, so juries also um, protect citizens from excessive state power or abuse. So they are this safeguard against that potential for state abuse. So effectively, they're keeping the state in check, um, ensuring that only the deserving are convicted, in theory at least, um, and that the innocent are freed. They also guarantee that law is accessible and understandable. You know, the, the lawyers that in the court need to make sure that people understand, lay people are understanding what the law is. And that, again, is a really important part of the rule of law. Like, how can we agree to be uh, made subject to the law if we don't understand it? Um, so intelligibility of the law is really fundamental. Um, in theory, at least, juries bring a fair mindedness um, and a common sense. Um, to their decision making, particularly as well, they can bring a local knowledge um, to local crime. So in that way, they can diffuse kind of centralised state power. Um, and because the jury is more or less randomly selected, it creates the possibility of countering any class, race or gender biases which might exist in the criminal justice system that other might, otherwise might have been left unchallenged. Um, and um, an academic, Cheryl Thomas, um, has done work sort of exploring that and sort of supports that idea that they can be this, um, this counter. So finally, then, they may refuse to apply the law when they believe that the outcome will be unjust, which is known as jury nullification. And that last point there links to the, the quote by Devlin at the top of the slide. Um, so in 1956, Devlin famously described the, law, the jury as um, the lamp that shows that freedom lives. So what did he mean by that? Well, for Devlin to abolish the jury trial um, would have been a step towards totalitarianism, where the state 
commands too much unchallengeable power over its people. So juries disperse that top down state power. And what Devlin suggests is that the jury does this by because they are uh, effectively like a little quasi parliament, like a little mini parliament. Uh, so their decisions are therefore democratic and therefore legitimate. Um, so much so, says Devlin, that juries might interpret the law in such a way as to give effect to the verdict that they want rather than the verdict that the law expects. Um, so in more extreme circumstances, they might even refuse to apply the law that they've been directed to apply if they believe that that outcome would be unjust or it wouldn't reflect modern norms, for example. And so, yeah, as I say, that's been termed uh, jury nullification. So I, the effect is that the law as it was intended becomes nullified by the jury's decision. Um, now, a clear case and sort of the archetypal case that we always refer to um, about jury nullification was the Clive Ponting case uh, back in the 1980s. Um, it was a case in which the defendant um, was a serving Labour MP. He admitted the facts that were presented by the prosecution, namely that he had revealed state secrets to the press. And those state secrets concerned the sinking of the Belgrano warship in the Falklands War. Right. The, the judge directed the jury that Clive Ponting had no legal defence. So um, that was his direction. And yet the jury returned a not guilty verdict, essentially because they believe that he was right to have released that information to the press. He, they, they delivered a verdict effectively that was in line with their moral conscience as opposed to their legal obligation. But does that kind of decision, does that enhance your um, confidence in the criminal justice system? Does it make you feel better about the criminal law and happy to be made subject to the, the criminal law? Or does it concern you? Um, because if it concerns you, you'd be more like Lord Old, um, who regarded verdicts like the Ponting case as perverse and an anathema to justice. He described jury nullification as a blatant affront to the legal process. And that's because Lord Old reiterates this idea that um, the jury is there to determine the facts of what happened in a case, apply those law, apply the laws to the facts, and then to determine the defendant's guilt. What he says is that jurors are not there to substitute their view of what the law should be. Um, he says that's the job of Parliament. So Old had concerns that because um, jurors don't have to give their reasons, because jurors give their, they, they deliberate in private, they might just be making decisions irrationally on an irrational secret, he described it as. Um, so even academics are not allowed to sit in deliberation rooms. Um, so according to Old, juries should apply the law and whilst they might have the power to return these kind of perverse verdicts, they really don't have the right to do so and they need to be discouraged from doing so. That's not their function. So in short, he says that jury nullification undermines the rule of law uh, and the idea that the law applies equally to all of us um, and clearly and consistently is applied is undermined by jury nullification. Um, so yeah, other, other problems with um, the jury system might include, for example, the fact that juries do get it wrong. You know, the innocent can be found guilty, um, which leads to mis miscarriages of justice, and the guilty can be acquitted. Um, juries might also be relying on prejudicial, biased or irrational reasoning, and we just simply wouldn't know. Um, that famously, one um, jurors, one, one jury made their decision after consulting a Ouija board, for example. Um, in response to the idea that the jury is democratic, um, just recall that not everybody is um, on the electoral roll, so uh, it's not drawing from everybody. Um, jurors are untrained, they are not lawyers. Can they really then decide complex legal matters? Do they really understand the rules of evidence that the judge explains to them? Uh, they can be slow to deliberate, which obviously increased the costs um, of trials. And also they can be a little bit naive, perhaps, 
um, or unaware of courtroom tactics where lawyers are manipulating the information that they hear. But I'm thinking particularly in, in the course of cross-examination. Um, so there, in short, we have a short introduction to the, what the jury is, what it does, and what values it can represent in, in modern uh, democratic state. So I'm going to hand over to Alison now, who's going to talk to you about um, the Black Letter Law Criminal Damage. Okay, um, so what we'd like to look at now is in part the role that a jury may play in determining whether a specific criminal offence is made out. And to demonstrate this, we've decided to speak with you about criminal damage. And criminal damage is quite an interesting offence because there are a variety of different bits of criminal damage which are more open to interpretation where you can sort of see individuals own perspectives coming into play. So criminal damage is what is known as a statutory offense, which means that it's set out in an act of parliament. And specifically criminal damage is defined in the aptly named Criminal Damage Act of 1971. And it's in section one of this act that we will be discussing today. So section one covers what's known as basic criminal damage. There are other criminal damage offenses, um, such as criminal damage using fire, which would fall into arson. But for our purposes, we're sticking with basic criminal damage for today. And section one of the act states that a person who without lawful excuse destroys or damages any property belonging to another, intending to destroy or damage any such property, or being reckless as to whether any such property would be destroyed or damaged shall be guilty of an offense. So in order to establish the offense of criminal damage, we have to prove two different elements. The first is the actus reus, which in essence is the guilty act. What is the action which has been done, which is capable of constituting a criminal offense? Each of these elements is comprised of multiple point, parts. So the actus reus for criminal damage has four distinct components. First, it must be determined that there has been destruction or damage. Um, that damage must have been done to property. That property must belong to another and it must have been done without lawful excuse. Some of these criteria are generally much more straightforward to prove than others, such as the fact that something is property or that it belongs to another. But the question of what constitutes damage or destruction or what might be sufficient to justify a lawful excuse are things that have given the courts a bit more trouble over the years. The other elements that need to be proven for this offense are those of the mens rea, and the mens rea is the mental element of the offense. So in order to substantiate the full offense, you have to have your actus reus, which is your guilty act, and you have to have your mental element. Now, the mental element of criminal damage requires that the individual has intention or recklessness as to the damage or destruction, as well as the knowledge or belief that the property belong to one belong to another. Um, so let's look at one of the trickier parts of criminal damage, one of the more open parts of criminal damage. So to start today, we'll look at what it means to actually destroy or damage property. Now, this is one of the areas which is not actually defined within the act. We don't have a clear definition within the act of this is what we mean by destroy and this is what we mean by damage. And in law, where we don't have that clear definition, what we do is we look at relevant case law and we look at how it's been interpreted by the courts to determine what the sort of parameters of that definition might be. And so within criminal damage, we have two areas. We have destroy, which is fairly straightforward. Um, when you destroy something, you make it useless from that point on. So if you think about throwing a brick through a window and shattering the window, the window is destroyed. It's no longer fit for purpose. It's not going to do what the window is intended to do. There's also an element of finality. It's very hard to put sort of broken pieces back together to restore the window to its previous state. So there's that element of permanence that we see with destruction. And to that end, destruction does tend to be a bit more clear cut. It's permanent, there's a finality to it, 
it's just rendered completely useless. Damage, on the other hand, can be more subjective. So what does it mean to damage something? In some cases, this might be very straightforward, but in others, it will be more open. And the courts have found, and relevant case law have found, that there are sort of two classifications of what might constitute damage for the purpose of the Criminal Damage Act. The first is whether there's been an impairment to the usefulness of the property. And this could be temporary. It doesn't have to be a permanent impairment. And I'll give you a bit of an example. So there is a case, it's the case of the Crown versus FIAC. And Mr. FIAC was under arrest and he was being held in detention at a police station. And he was not best pleased with his situation. Um, and he decided to take some actions to express his displeasure at being detained in a police station. So what he did is he took the blanket off his bed in the cell and he stuffed it down the toilet. And then he proceeded to flush the toilet repeatedly so that he would flood the cell. He was charged then, and ultimately he ended up being convicted of criminal damage. And he appealed. He said it was a bit of water. Yes, I flooded it, but it was a bit of water. It couldn't possibly be damaged because it's just a bit of water. Um, and the court held that actually it could be criminal damage. And what they looked at here is they said that the cell was temporarily put out of use whilst it had to be cleaned in order to deal with the flooding that he had caused. And also it looked at things like the blanket. The blanket was temporarily out of use because it couldn't be used for its intended purpose until it had been cleaned and until it had been dried. And that was deemed as sufficient to amount to damage. So the first way you might find damage is if there's an impairment to the value or the usefulness. The second way you might find that something has been damaged is if time, expense, and effort has to be taken in order to fix the property. And there's no parameters on how much time has to be taken or how much money might have to be spent to fix it. It's been left quite broad. And so it applies in a range of different circumstances. So to give you an example, in the case of Hardman versus Chief Constable of Avon and Somerset Constabulary, um, the defendant painted the pavement. And he painted the pavement with a water-based paint that would wash off the next time it rained. So it wasn't a permanent fixture. It wasn't a permanent installation. And had it just been left, until the next rainstorm, it would have been gone. However, the council chose in that instance to pay for a jet wash to remove the paint. And in that, it took time and it took expense to rectify the damage. So it was sufficient to meet the requirements of criminal damage. So in that instance, even though it would have been the same outcome had they left it alone. It was still deemed to be criminal damage. But there are other areas where it is quite difficult to work out what is damage. For instance, what some people might see as damage, somebody else might view as an improvement or they might even view it as art. And the court has found it's for the jury or magistrates to decide whether there has been damage. And that's what we'd like to put to you now. So we'll show you three pictures. And for each, we'd like you to just click on the little poll um, and let us know whether you think something is damaged. And if you have any thoughts about why you view something as damaged and or why you view something as not damaged, please feel free to add them to the chat. Um, so the first image we're showing, and hopefully the poll is being launched, um, is an image um, of obviously some tags. So a bit of street graffiti, which is located on Stower Street in Canterbury. <laughs> so if you just take a second and just click whether you think this is criminal damage or it is not. So yes or no. There's a really interesting point in the chat on whether it's private property. Um, 
Well, it doesn't necessarily have to be private property, although if you mean if it's done with the consent of the owners in that way. So if it's your private property and you choose to graffiti or tag your own property, that's acceptable. But I guess for the purposes of this, consider that each, each example relates to property belonging to someone else. I think we can assume that the person who did this didn't own the property, yeah. Okay, so we have the results of the poll and yes, pretty much universally, it seems to be the opinion of the room that this would constitute criminal damage. And this is quite interesting because obviously there's a range of different types of graffiti um, that can potentially take place, but it might be different if you looked at it in a different context. So let's look at the next example. Okay, so this is an example, if we get our poll going again, um, of something that is called yarn bombing, right? Or graffiti knitting, um, depending on who you ask. And you may have seen this, it's taken hold in a lot of different areas. But do you think that this could constitute criminal damage? So I'll give you a second to fill in the poll. And with this, so with yarn bombing, I think you can look at it in a very different context to the tagging from the initial, the initial image. So here we have something that's a bit bright, a bit happy, <laughs> um, that could potentially be viewed in a particular context, depending. So the polls disappeared from my window, so I don't know. Ah, there we go. There it is. <laughs> okay. Ah, interesting. So now we have a bit more of a split. So we have some of you think that it is criminal damage and some of you think that it's not. Mm. Um, it starts looking a bit more subjective. Absolutely. And I wouldn't wonder if in some ways it's the view of what this is for. Is it an example of perhaps antisocial behavior or is it something that's viewed as, you know, done by little old ladies to brighten up the village green and whether or not that could potentially influence the perspectives as to whether something is criminal damage. I mean, it still takes time to rectify the, the tree back to its original state. So technically could be criminal damage, but would you want it to be? Different question, yeah. Do you want me to pull up the next one? Yeah, um, so the final one we're going to ask you to decide on is an image of street art. Um, this is a mural that was painted by Banksy, who's a very well-known and famous street artist. It was painted shortly after the Brexit referendum. Um, it was done on the side of a derelict building in the port of Dover. And essentially it shows an individual chiseling away one of the, one of the stars from the EU flag. So would you view this as an example of criminal damage? And keep in mind here that the various elements that are required for criminal damage. So is it damage to property? Buildings generally are considered property. Does it belong to another? Um, but fundamentally, is it damage? Does it impact on the usefulness or will it take time, effort and money to rectify? I'll give you just another minute there to decide whether you think this is criminal damage or not. Okay, so yes, criminal damage. 86% um, say yes and 14% say no. 
And it's quite an interesting one, isn't it? Because it's, to many, it's art and it's an artistic installation. And in fact, this Banksy mural, once it was completed, was valued at a million pounds. So it has significant value um, in terms of what it can potentially bring to the building. Now, just as an additional point on this, this was then later painted over. And we don't have a poll slide for this one, I don't believe, but if you just put in the chat or just let us know by a show of hands, um, how many of you think that painting over the original painting to sort of restore it, not to the exact same color, of slightly dingy white, um, do you, would you view this as criminal damage? Or is this an acceptable response? to the Banksy mural. So maybe if those of you who put up, who think it is criminal damage could put up your hands and we can just have a quick sort of straw poll. Okay. Now, would it change your mind or does it change your mind if you are made aware that it wasn't the owners of the property that painted it, right? This was another individual. So the owners of the property, obviously, were not Banksy, didn't paint it. Um, but similarly, the person that then painted over it was equally not the owner of the property. So it's quite interesting to see that this would be viewed as less, um, less likely to be criminal damage by most of you in the room, as opposed to the original Banksy. So the idea of this is just to really give you an idea of how open it can be to interpretation and how different views might be put forward as to whether something actually meets that core actus reus requirement of damage. Um, the next part of criminal damage which has to be proven is the mens rea element. So once you've proven that there was in fact damage to property belonging to another, you need to ensure that you can also prove the mental element. I will just briefly go over this, um, but there are two core parts to this. The first is intention or recklessness as to the damage. Now intention just means it's your purpose, it's your aim. You do something and you mean to cause the damage. Um, so you throw a brick through a window intending to shatter the window. Recklessness is a little bit more open. So recklessness is actually a subjective test. And this was determined for criminal damage in the case of R versus G and R. And in this, there were two young boys who, they were aged 11 and 12. They set some newspapers near a bin behind a grocery store on fire, and then they left. They didn't put out the fire, um, but the fire then spread to the bins and then the fire spread to the rest of the building and it caused about a million pounds worth of damage to the shopping center. Now, before this case, it was an objective test for recklessness, which was what would a reasonable man think or what would a reasonable man realize in this situation? And in this case, it was appealed because it wasn't necessarily fair to be looking at what a reasonable man who's an adult um, would have done in the same situation and then apply it to an 11 year old and a 12 year old who don't have that level of understanding. So what has happened now is we now have a subjective test for recklessness. Um, and that means that when a person acts recklessly, they do so if they're aware of a risk and in the circumstances of it, they take that risk when it's unreasonable to do so. So that's just a quick overview of mens rea. And then I will quickly just go through the final element for criminal damage, which is specifically about the lawful excuse part. And we're gonna talk about this a bit more in context. So I'm just gonna do a very quick overview here. Now the actus reus of criminal damage requires that the damage be done without lawful excuse. So you have to understand what a lawful excuse might be. When would it be acceptable to damage property? Well, the first time it might be is when you have the consent of the owner or the reasonable belief that the owner consents. Um, so in that regard, you have a lawful excuse and you wouldn't be liable for criminal damage. 
The next way that the law sets out that you can have a lawful excuse for criminal damage is if you are of the belief that the property is in immediate need of protection and that the means you have taken in order to protect the property is reasonable in the circumstances. So that you could see, for instance, if there is a fire or something and you have to take actions in order to protect the property next door, but it does involve damaging the other property, well, that is a necessary element that provides a lawful excuse. There are other ways to exercise lawful excuse as well, which aren't specifically confined to the Criminal Damage Act, but they apply more generally. So you can use reasonable force to prevent a crime and that can be a lawful excuse. And we do have some questions over whether protest techniques, which might amount to criminal damage, could constitute a lawful excuse on the basis of freedom of expression. So we're now going to look at an example which demonstrates these elements of lawful excuse in practice. Yeah, thank you. So this is the case of the Colston Four, which you may uh, recall. Um, I'll just briefly tell you what the facts of this case were. Essentially, back in June 2020, during the global Black Lives Matter protests, which were prompted after the police murder of George Floyd in the US, in Bristol, in England, um, protesters toppled the statue of the slave trader Edward Colston. Now, Colston was quite well known in Bristol because um, he had uh, got his money through um, the trade of African people as slaves, um, but he had been a local benefactor with that money. He had given money to build municipal buildings and schools, for example. But Bristolians had long been in conversation with the council to have that statue removed um, because obviously of the abhorrent source of the, the income that was used um, that he used. But they'd not been successful in those conversations. But on this day in June, they, they used rope uh, to pull the statue down, they smeared paint on it, and one protester put his knee on the neck of the statue to reference George Floyd's murder. And the statue was then rolled and pushed into Bristol Harbour. Now, the defendants in their trial did not dispute those facts. In fact, they accepted that they brought the rope and the paint from home to do this. Um, but they maintained that they were not guilty of the offence of criminal damage. Now, having heard the evidence, there were three possible defences left to the jury. So the first one um, was that the jury were told uh, that they would be found not guilty if um, they accepted that the defendants had a lawful excuse. Now, um, here, the defendant said that they were using reasonable force to prevent a crime. And the crime being committed, they said, was that the statue was an offensive, abusive visual image. And that's an offence under Section 5 of the Public Order Act. In addition to that offence, they also said that it, the statue itself was an indecent display. And that is an offence under the Indecent Displays Act. Now, the defence called Professor David Olusoga, you might know him, famous um, sort of historian that appears on television, and he gave evidence to support that line of defence. Um, he detailed the history of Edward Colston, the fact that he had been the CEO of the Royal African Company, who had enslaved and shipped tens of thousands of African people in these violent and brutal conditions. Um, and it was argued by the defence that the display of a memorial to Colston was therefore both indecent and abusive, such that it would be um, a criminal offence to display it. Now, when considering that defence, there were three questions for the jury. So um, question one, did the defendants honestly believe that a crime was being committed? You don't have to accept that a crime was being committed. You just have to accept that the defendants honestly believed that a crime was being committed. Second, were the defendants' actions um, in order to prevent those crimes being committed? And then thirdly, um, did the defendant's actions amount to reasonable force to stop that crime as the defendants perceived it to be? The burden is on the prosecution to show that this defence did not apply beyond reasonable doubt. So that's the first possible route to a not guilty verdict if you accept this, uh, that they were trying to prevent the commission of a, a, a further crime. Secondly, um, 
the um, defendants argue that the damage was done with the consent of the owners. Here, what they argued was that the people of Bristol were the owners of the statue and that they had therefore um, a lawful excuse because they said that the owners, the people of Bristol, would have consented to the damage had they known. So that's another possible uh, line of defence. The prosecution said that the defendants had no such belief and um, they'd taken no steps to consult the people of Bristol about that. But again, the burden's on the prosecution to disprove that this defence does not apply. And finally, the jury were asked to consider a more complex argument which concerned human rights. So we all have um, rights to freedom of expression, freedom um, of assembly, and those rights are enshrined within Articles 10 and 11 of the European Convention of Human Rights. Those rights are not absolute, though. The, the state can qualify those rights. For example, we have state laws preventing criminal damage. They can be permitted. But the argument is that even if the jury were um, convinced of the defendant's guilt of, of criminal damage, even if they thought criminal damage had been um, uh, committed, question was, would it be a proportionate response, bearing in mind their right to express themselves and to assemble in protest, to give them a criminal conviction for that? Is that proportionate? So those are your three routes to verdict. You might just for completeness be interested to know that the defence did try to argue that um, there was no damage caused to this statue because actually the value of this statue has gone up massively. It's now a really expensive exhibit sitting in a museum. So, But that was not um, an, op an option left to the jury. The, the judge said, no, you're not, you're not having that. This was damage. Um, just to give you a flavour of what the barristers were saying in the courtroom on that day, in their closing speeches, the barrister for the Crown said, um, so for the prosecution, they said this trial is about cold, hard facts and it's fundamentally about the rule of law. If we can simply pull down what offends us regardless of the views of others, then what statues, institutions or buildings are next, might you ask? So that was the Crown. In response, in their closing speeches, the defence said to the jury, be on the right side of history and you will also be on the right side of the law. The Colston statue normalized abuse. It condoned the shrugging acceptance of racism. It celebrated the achievements of a racist mass murderer. The continued existence of that statue was a racist hate crime. Toppling the statue had increased its value rather than destroying history, sorry, and rather than destroying history, they had created it. That's what the defense said. So yeah. I guess over to you, yeah. Yeah, so we'd like to know what you would have decided had you been on the jury of the Colston Four trial. So you've heard what your role as a juror is according to the oath you would have sworn at the start of the trial. Your role is to dispassionately apply the facts to the law. So we want you to consider what the elements of the offense of criminal damage are that must be proved. Um, so was damage caused to property belonging to someone other than the defendants? And importantly, did they do so without a lawful excuse? So as a juror, you're not to bring any bias to that exercise. You shouldn't bring any politics or any prejudice to it. So you have to consider whether the possible defenses which were put forward have the Crown proved that they were not the case? So remember that the burden is on the prosecution, as Antonia has said. So might the defendants have believed that a crime was being committed in displaying the statue as they were using, and they were using reasonable force to stop that? Did they believe the owners of the statue, the owners here being the people of Bristol, consented or would have consented to the damage? And would a conviction be a disproportionate infringement to their right to protest. I think it's important to note here, you don't have to find every single one of those defenses is viable. Um, you just have to determine whether any one of them would be enough to persuade you. But you've also heard that your unofficial role as a juror might allow you to bring your own moral conscience to this. And so tact is a safeguard where state action becomes excessive or where the facts don't merit criminal convictions for defendants. Even if you think the defendants were guilty at law, might you ignore that because of 
the idea that the defendants were right overall to pull down the statue, particularly in the context of the Black Lives Matter protest. If you do that, however, consider whether acting in that way risks undermining the very foundations on which the rule of law is built. So this idea that we need to have a consistent and unbiased application of the law. So do we have a do we have a poll for this one? So we will just ask you to choose whether you believe the Colston Four should be found guilty or not guilty. And if you are willing, it would be fantastic to hear your reasoning in the chat. Obviously, we don't generally get exposed to the jury's reasoning, but it would be very interesting to know what might be the reasons motivating your decision. And we've had, so in the chat already, we've had a really interesting point. So even though the actions were justified and they had reason, it's wrong to make an exception to that. Um, if it's allowed, it shows anybody can do this and they if they believe they have the right cause. So it's a very interesting point and a very good point, this idea that where do we then draw the line? Are we potentially opening up the floodgates to having more claims being put forward? Um, along these lines, if we accept this as a legitimate defense to the actions of the Colston Four. Could we have a look at the, the results? Ooh, very balanced. 45% said guilty and 55% said not guilty. So actually um, that aligns with the actual verdict. The actual verdict was not guilty in this case. So the Colston four, um, yeah, were acquitted. Um, and this did launch quite a lot of discussion in the media after the event. So you have people typically actually on the right side of the political spectrum. So Robert Jenrick is a Conservative MP and he commented that we undermine the rule of law which underpins our democracy if we accept vandalism and criminal damage or acceptable forms of polit political protest. Um, similarly, um, Robert Buckland, another Conservative MP, used to be the, the former Justice Secretary, actually, said, I don't think we want to see our Crown Courts becoming political playgrounds. They're not places for politics. They're places for the law to be applied and for the evidence to be assessed. So he's very much in line with Lord Old, both of these very much in line with the, the thinking that Lord Old had about the role of the jury. But then... Um, Cut to David Allen Green, a lawyer, who said the acquittal of the Colston Four is the sound of a working constitution. So he's very much in line with Lord Devlin and this idea that um, the jury act as this mini parliament, bringing their own moral conscience to, to their decision making. Um, so since the Colston Four, you might be interested to know that the government did appeal um, the uh, decision, saying that the judge had made an error in law, um, that appeal, the government appeal was unsuccessful, so the acquittals um, stand. Um, but the government did respond in a different way. They've introduced a new criminal offence and the offence is criminal damage to a memorial. And the effect of that specifically is that it increases the maximum sentence that you can receive. If your damage was under £5,000, instead of receiving a maximum sentence of three months, which was previously the case, you could now be sentenced to up to 10 years imprisonment. So the, the government came down hard in that way. Um, but uh, yeah, perhaps you might feel that the recent sort of stop oil protesters, um, they might have been inspired or perhaps emboldened by the Colston Four verdict. So that perhaps gives credence to their, those closing comments that the um, Crown barrister said in, in the trial, you know, what next? So that there, that does seem to be pos possible that these protesters have been inspired um, by the Colston Four verdict. Who knows? We can't know. <laughs> But um, yeah. Are there any other reasons in the chats given for the verdicts, Alison, or is that? Um, not as of yet. Okay, no problem. No problem. 
So yeah, I guess that sort of sums up what we wanted to talk to you today about. <laughs> and we want to sort of leave you with three things to think about after this session and going, going forward. Um, so the first is, is it right that juries can act in accordance with their own conscious, irrespective of the law? Should we change things? Should we have some sort of mechanism in place to ensure that jurors only act in accordance with the law? Or does that element of moral consciousness, is that an important element to bring in to the judicial process? Um, should juries be required to prove reasons for their verdicts? So other jurisdictions do have this, jurors are permitted, we don't. So is that something that you think we should institute within this jurisdiction? Or should we replace juries altogether? Should we put a single professional judge in place? Um, and how might that then influence the idea of justice in our criminal system? Cool, thank you. Um, if you wanted to uh, look a little bit further into this topic, um, really recommend the Secret Barrister's blog on this. He really, um, it goes through the law really well, sort of pointing out what the possible defences were and what the possible routes to verdict were. Um, you might also be interested, if you haven't already seen it, there's a film called 12 Angry Men. It stars Henry Fonda, who's a bit of a hero of mine. So it's quite old. I think it um, was made maybe in the 50s or 60s. Um, and it's basically, the whole film is set in the jury deliberation room. So it's quite a nice little insight into what discussions may or may not take place in a, in a jury room. Then finally, there is um, an academic journal article there by Ian Edwards, which discusses whether um, Banksy would have a um, a defence to the the charge of criminal damage. Um, so that's yeah a really great article that's quite um, quite technical but really interesting. I'm hoping I think Kiara, who um, has uh, organised all of this summer of law, might will be able to email you with some of those links. Um, Yes, obviously you can keep up to date with us <laughs> um, at Kent Law School and the Summer of Law sessions are all um, held in a back catalogue on YouTube as well. If you've missed any, you can go back and watch those. And then finally. Just thank you. Um, it's been fantastic having you attend and we hope that you found it interesting. And as Antonia said, do go back if you haven't had a chance to look at the other sessions. There's some great stuff up on YouTube and hopefully we'll see you at Kent. Yeah, brilliant. See you in September, hopefully. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye bye.